Our next guest wants us all to connect more. Mark Brackett is an emotional scientist, a Yale professor, and he thinks emotional intelligence skills should be taught from an early age. With mental health issues rising exponentially, his work has never been more pressing, and he spoke to our Michel Martin about his new book, Permission to Feel, and how he spent years learning how to do just that. Mark Brackett, thank you so much for talking with us. My pleasure. The thing about this book that I like is that you make it sound so simple, but it really isn't. I guess I'll start with the title, which is, Why Do We Need Permission to Feel? You know, permission to feel is a, it's an important term for me because as a child, I didn't have that permission. Um, I had a tough childhood and nobody asked me to talk about my feelings. Uh, nobody saw what was going on for me, even though it was pretty clear. And so I chose that title because I felt that people have to be given that permission. Mm -hmm. And especially adults who are raising kids and teachers who are teaching kids, we need to create contexts where children have the permission to experience all emotions and where they have the permission to express them. And you talk about it in the book, but do you mind sharing here? What is it that led to that light bulb moment for you? How did you come to understand how important it is to be given permission to feel? Well, as a child, I had an abuse situation. I also was bullied pretty horrifically. And I was very unhappy, and I was a poor student in school. And somehow I knew I was smart, but I just couldn't perform well academically. Um, I had two parents who loved me dearly, but my mom was a very anxious woman. So when I would even talk to her about my bullying, she might say, oh my goodness, honey, don't tell me, I'll have a breakdown. And my father was a, also a great man, but he was like, son, you gotta toughen up. So I learned very quickly as a kid, you know what? Mom's gonna have a breakdown if I tell her how I'm feeling, and Dad's gonna just keep on telling me to toughen up. Uh, but there was some wizard that came into my life, and his name was Uncle Marvin. And uh, He really is your uncle. He really is my uncle. And uh, he was an interesting character because he was a middle school teacher by day and a band leader at a Casco Mountain Hotel by night. And uh, Uncle Marvin was developing a program to teach kids about feelings through his social studies class. And he was getting a master's degree when I was in my middle school years. I'll just never forget, you know, one day he just said, you know, how are you feeling? And then he just paused. And his facial expression, his body language was so open. And I knew it was a time to just tell him how I really felt, which was angry, scared. The list goes on. And then he just said, well, what can we do about it? Mm. It wasn't what can you do about it. It was what, what can we do about it? And that, um, to me, was the first adult who heard me and the first adult who listened to me and was there um, with unconditional love and support. I don't want to glide past what you said, you know, an abuse situation. I mean, this is a terrible situation. You were abused. The person who abused you was abusing other Correct. people. Um, I hope this person was brought to justice at some point. It was held accountable for his conduct? Well, I was the person responsible for that. And you would think that would be something positive, which it was to some extent. But unfortunately, growing up where I was in New Jersey in the 1980s when this happened, um, the, the block turned against our family because uh, we added you know, the pedophile. And it was quite uh, scary for me mm -hmm. because parents were telling their kids not to play with me. Uh, you know, I was on public television, actually, um, when I was 11 years old, talking about this, which this kind of a deja vu moment for mm -hmm. me, because it, I think it was inappropriate mm -hmm. for me to be on TV at 11, disclosing my abuse mm -hmm. nationwide. Mm -hmm. um, I'm and, sorry for that. Yeah, well, the ramifications, you know, were that, you know, stay away from Mark, you know, he's damaged goods. Mm -hmm. um, but now it's 39 years later, and look what I'm getting to do. Mm -hmm. The reason I'm thinking about that, though, is this, that, you know, forgive me, this isn't when dinosaurs walked the earth. I mean, it's not like people didn't understand that there was a language of feelings, that feelings matter, that the abuse of a child matters, that a kid should have an opportunity to express himself. And I'm just curious, like, why has it taken so long for people to understand that this matters? Because people in general see emotions and feelings as weak. Um, like a man having shame a man feeling fear, right? You know, it reminds me recently when I was giving a presentation, a father who heard me speak about my childhood said, I can't believe how much you talk about your childhood and your bullying. Like, I would never let my son know I was bullied because he would think I was weak. 
And, you know, it's eye-opening, you know. And what I said to him was, well, what if your son is being bullied, right? But you're sending messages to him that say, I'm not here to listen to you. Mm -hmm. You know, what would that mean? How would that make you feel as a dad to your child? One of the arguments that you make is it doesn't, this isn't just about abuse situations, as, as you put no, it. This is all. about a skill that you think people need to learn. Can you talk more about that? These are life skills. So, you know, yes, I had a traumatic childhood that led me to this path. Um, I also want to just say that I feel blessed that I had that uncle. You know, I got involved in the martial arts, which was a big part of my life. I majored in psychology. I went for therapy. Like, I spent a lot of time giving myself permission to feel. But putting that aside for a moment, you know, just from the, from, life is saturated with emotion. The moment we wake up, you know, we think about our workplace and we say, do I want to go to work today? Do I not want to go to work today? The commute, you know, meeting one, meeting two, meeting three, life is just filled with emotion. And what we know from our research is that emotions drive five really big things, our attention, right? So how we feel drives where our brains uh, pay attention. The second is decision making. Think about that, how you feel influences your choices and your judgments from what you eat to what you buy to um, how nice you are or not nice you are to somebody. The third is the quality of our relationships. You know, how you feel, right? If you're feeling down and depressed, uh, you're probably not going to approach the world. But when you're feeling inspired and connected, you're going to want to move forward. The fourth is mental health and physical health. And finally, uh, something that I think everyone should care about, which is performance in school and work and creativity. So emotions are responsible and behind almost everything we do in life. Hmm. I would make an argument that all those things are things that everybody should care about, like relationships and, you know, exactly. uh, social interactions and yeah. things like that. Sort. And so, people don't yeah. lose their jobs because of their abilities in the cognitive area usually, right? It's because of their inability to regulate. Right. Think about your life in terms of the people who you've liked to work with and didn't like to work with. Oftentimes, it's the people who just don't have the skills to manage their feelings. Mm -hmm. So where do you want us to start in thinking about this? Wow. Um, I want us to start uh, maybe in utero. <laughs> <laughs> okay. uh, I'm serious, though. You know, um, how moms and dads experience the world affects, you know, the fetus. Um, but truthfully, you know, my work is in schools and in workplaces. So I believe that everyone deserves an emotion education. It just, it needs to be part of the way we think about education from preschool to high school to college to becoming a lawyer, doctor, teacher, whatever your profession is. So you're saying, say, say that again, you're saying everybody deserves an emotion education. That's correct. Okay, now that's connected to this idea of emotional intelligence, correct. right? Isn't it? Could you just talk a little bit more about what that is? I mean, this is a term that I think a lot of people have heard for quite some time, yes. in fact. So, but what is it exactly? We see emotional intelligence as a set of skills that help us to use our emotions wisely. So it starts off with recognizing emotions, right? Am I aware of how I'm feeling? Am I aware how you're feeling? And then the question is, do I know where that feeling came from? Is it what I said? Is it what I did? Is it from a memory? Like what's causing my feelings? The third is, what's the exact feeling? What's the precise word? For example, in the angry category, am I peeved? Am I angry or am I enraged? In the sad family, am I down, am I disappointed, or am I hopeless? And in the happy family, am I content, or am I happy, or am I ecstatic? That's the first uh, set of skills we call the RUL of RULER, our acronym, hmm. which helps us to make meaning out of our own and other people's emotional lives. Then we have the E and the R, which is expressing and regulating emotion. That has to do with what we do with our feelings. Mm -hmm. So do I have the permission to be my authentic, true self with you? Can I express my feelings at home, at school, at work? And do I know how to express them in a way that gets my needs met, that helps other people? And then finally, I think the big, big one is regulation of emotion. So what are the strategies that I use to prevent unwanted feelings, to reduce the difficult ones, or even to create the ones that I want to have in life? People are very, I think, aware of wanting kids to regulate their emotions. I mean, that's kind of what school is all about, right? Sit still, don't mm. throw your pencil at this other kid who made you mad, that yeah. kind of thing. But I think what I hear you saying is, is that we are very aware of wanting kids to regulate their emotions, but we don't tell them how to do it. Uh, why is that? I, because the adults who are raising and teaching kids have not had an adequate emotion education. Mm -hmm. So, you know, think about that. When we're 
you know, frustrated and overwhelmed as teachers, as parents, calm down, mm -hmm. sit down, you know, be still. And um, that's not being a great role model, right? You can't yell at someone to calm down. <laughs> it doesn't really make much sense. And I think importantly, what we also forget is that emotions are what we like to say co-regulated. Think about this. In a classroom, in a home, in a workplace, right? How, as the manager, as the leader, if I walk into a, I might have a team of 50 in my center. If I walk into a meeting and be like, all right, we got to write another grant. <laughs> <laughs> it's going to bring, you know, it's going to change the mood. So mm -hmm. emotions are co-regulated, right? We're in relationships most of our day. You know, one of the things that's gotten a lot of attention in recent years is just how stressed out adolescents are, and, and kids, too. I mean, not just adolescents. I just wanted some of the, the data. In 2017, about 8% of adolescents aged 12 to 17 and 25 percent of young adults uh, describe themselves as current users of illicit drugs. The number of incidents of bullying and harassment in the United States in K through 12 schools, this is according to the Anti-Defamation League, doubled each year between 2015 and 2017. Um, internationally, this is an issue. Apparently, depression is, a, is the leading cause of d disability worldwide. So. Do you feel that your area of study, emotional intelligence, is also a factor here in some of these issues that we are describing? I think it says why we need these skills more than ever. You know, and, you know, we don't think of emotional intelligence as being an individual skill. This is a skill that is about, yes, the individual I need to regulate when I'm by myself in the airport and I'm stressed out and overwhelmed, but I also need these strategies uh, with my partner, with my family. I need them at work. And, you know, the truth is, is that communities and, and organizations have feelings. So if you uh, are a leader of a company, I give an example. I was at a big financial company here in New York City, mm -hmm. and one of the top executives, you know, he heard me speak, and he's like, you know, this is kind of interesting, but, you know, I don't need this training. And I said, well, what do you mean? He's like, well, look at me. I'm, I'm the boss. Like, I can do whatever I want. Mm -hmm. But, you know, maybe I'll have you train the people who work for me because then they'll have skills to deal with me. How do you respond to that, though? Well, I mean, what he's saying is true, right? He doesn't care how he makes other people feel, right? Well, Am I right? He, he probably doesn't, but what he doesn't realize is that the people who work for him are going to have feelings, and how they feel is going to drive their decision-making, the quality of their work, how much time they spend on social media versus doing their work. So maybe if he spent more time thinking about how people felt, actually the company would do even better than it's doing. Hmm. Okay, so maybe extend that a little further. Make the business case for why people should should care. We did a national study in our center with 15,000 people across the workforce, from people who work in farming to people who work in finance. And what we found was that people who work for an emotionally intelligent, as opposed to an emotionally unintelligent supervisor, have different lives at work. Just to give you one example, feeling inspiration, which is an important thing probably to feel at work, there was a 50% difference in organizations, or for people, I should say, when they worked for someone who was high versus low in emotional intelligence. Creativity was significantly different mm -hmm. when you work for someone who's high in emotional intelligence. Your burnout levels, your stress levels, your intentions to leave your profession. So turnover is, has a high cost to organizations. And uh, so if how you feel is determined by the leadership's emotional intelligence, mm -hmm and there's greater turnover intentions when there's a leader who's low in emotional intelligence, my hunch is that they should read my book and learn these <laughs> skills because it's going to make a difference. And what about kids? Kids can't leave the institution by and large unless they really act out. I mean, they're kind of captured, right? So talk about kids. Like, why does it matter that kids learn these skills? Yeah. And the, well, people, and the people teaching those kids. Because, you know, emotions are the drivers of kids' attention in school, you know? People say things like, we only learn what we care about. So if we don't infuse emotion into the learning process and create that engagement, guess what? Students are going to get bored. They're going to get distracted. That's when bullying happens. That's when students drift off to, you know, into disengagement. So I think also what you're getting at is this idea of the climate of a classroom. So we've done research on that where we have literally videotaped classrooms and looked at the interactions between teachers and students. And what we find is that classrooms where there are teachers who are more emotionally skilled have students who are better learners, there's less bullying, there is uh, greater academic achievement. Can you just give us a couple of tips 
about how you can start giving yourself permission to feel so that you can be a more inspiring leader or teacher or, or be a more inspired student. I think you're saying it. That first thing that I talk about in my book is just giving yourself that permission, that recognize that emotions matter, that they're valuable sources of information. The second thing is, as I talk about in the book, is this idea of being an emotion scientist versus an emotion judge. So, for example, are you open to the experience of all emotions? Are you open to other people's feelings? Are you open to learning new strategies to help you be better managed, to help you regulate feelings better? The scientist is open. The judge says, you know what, this is who I am. Get over it. So we're trying to get people to be more like scientists than judges. And then the third is recognize that this is a lifelong journey, that you're not going to be perfect. And I think the big one is just practice regulating, like learn new strategies. And most people don't even, I didn't know what they were until I was a graduate student. So for example, engaging in more positive self-talk than negative self-talk, catch yourself like, wait a minute, I'm like, the other day, for example, I was working out in the morning and I said, Mark, you're going to be positive. And then I was looking at him, I'm like, oh God, your stomach. And then I looked at my legs, they're so white. <laughs> and I like trash myself. Like, 30, oh my goodness. You know? And I was like, wait a minute, Mark, like, you, like, that is not helpful. And it's like, just catch yourself when you're doing that negative talk and say, all right, how can I think about this in a different way? What's a different story that I can tell myself? Mark Rackett, thank you so much for talking with us. My pleasure. And how do you feel now? I feel relieved. Okay, <laughs> good, me too.